Lake Forest, Illinois has long been home to some of the wealthiest Americans of all time. But what happened to its largest and most opulent estate? Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to this house. In 1872, Edith Rockefeller was born to robber baron John D. Rockefeller, who amassed one of the largest fortunes the U.S. has ever seen through his ruthless business tactics as he secured nearly one half of the world's supply of crude oil for his company, Standard Oil. She had been born the fourth daughter in her father's mansion, which once sat on Cleveland's Millionaire's Row. Growing up, her household had very strict rules, which included daily chores, something nearly no other prominent families of the time imposed on their children. She was known to act out and throw fits of rage, and though her family presented themselves more humbly, she had a taste for expensive clothing and jewelry. At the age of 23, in 1895, Edith married Harold McCormick, whose father Cyrus McCormick built a fortune around his invention, the Mechanical Reaper, which allowed farmers to partially automate their work for the first time in history. As a wedding gift, John D. Rockefeller gifted the newlyweds $40 million to start their lives, the modern equivalent of about $1.5 billion. After spending some time in the then-thriving city of Council Bluffs, Iowa, the young couple decided to relocate back to Harold's hometown of Chicago. A lot had changed since Harold left. The city now had massive skyscrapers with a thriving entertainment district. Chicago's wealthiest residents were leaving the city center to build magnificent estates along the lakeshore. At this point, the couple began planning their dream house. They spent $2 million buying up 300 acres of lakefront property and hired architect Charles A. Platt to design them a mansion modeled after the homes of Italy's Lake Como. It was finished in a creamy stucco and accented by green shutters under a terracotta roof. Surrounding the mansion on all sides were lavish gardens stretching out for as far as the eye could see. The grounds received recognition from even the toughest of architecture critics, who claimed Villa Turicum had the finest Italian gardens in the United States. Not only were there expansive lawns in malls 100 feet wide, there were parterre gardens that broke into winding paths, and as you explored the grounds below the canopy of an old-growth forest, you would stumble upon sunken gardens with centuries-old statues serving as markers, enticing you to continue exploring. Unlike many country estates of the time, the service wing was carved from the extant forest so that it would not be immediately visible to guests, making sure the main house was the focus of the property. When it was all said and done, the purchase of the land, the design of the gardens, and the construction of their dream house cost a whopping $7 million, the modern equivalent of about $222 million today. Passing through the front doors, you would arrive in the entrance hall, where a gilded, coffered ceiling soared overhead. During its prime, the stone walls were covered over in centuries-old European tapestries and accented by antique furniture. As we make our way down the groin vaulted gallery, we will begin exploring each room. First, we will pass between marble columns supporting a glass ceiling resting above frescoed walls. This is the Pompeian Room, where the sounds of trickling water could be heard gently flowing from the fountain. Heading towards the back of the house, we will cut across the loggia to continue our tour. But before we go back inside, we can step out into the court to admire this fine country estate. And if we peek our heads out over the balustrade, we will find gardens terracing down the bluff towards Lake Michigan. Let's return to the loggia and make our way back inside. The library has been clad in floor-to-ceiling wood paneling, though most of the artisan millwork has been covered over in tapestries. The fireplace is flanked by electric candles, in a time when electricity was still considerably rare, even in the most opulent of estates. After making our way down a long, narrow corridor, we arrive in the drawing room, dazzled by displays of geometry both on the coffered ceiling and the herringbone floor. While the food would have usually been the most expensive part of a dinner party, Edith was known to never repeat her jewelry, even for smaller gatherings. It was rumored that she had millions of dollars of diamonds and emeralds stashed away after only ever wearing them once. Harold and Edith continued vacationing to this lavish country estate together for only nine years. Shortly after the completion of Villa Terracum, Edith fell into a deep depression. She tried to cheer herself up by getting involved in charity, setting up art museums, and funding medical research. But no matter how much time or money she donated, nothing could bring her cheer. 
Starting in 1913, she began making trips to Switzerland, where she sought the care of Carl Jung, who was leading in the emerging field of psychology. Though she found comfort with Jung's pseudoscientific approach to psychology, her husband Harold thought it was a sham, and the two officially separated. In 1921, the divorce was finalized. All the while, Edith had transformed from a prominent member of high society into an eccentric heiress with more money than any one person could reasonably spend. She started her own psychology practice based on Jung's work and built a patient list consisting of dozens of the world's most influential people. Around this time, she became increasingly spiritual and claimed that she was the reincarnation of King Tut's first wife, an astounding proclamation which undermined her status. Her friends and family began noticing a steep decline in her mental health, and she flew through marriages and called off engagements, sometimes with multiple fiancés in the same year. Her interests rapidly changed, and she would throw hordes of cash at her fleeting whims, though most of the time this was done by supporting authors and artists with endowments and even donating large tracts of land to be set aside for zoos, such as the world-renowned Brookfield Zoo in Chicago. All the while, she rarely visited Villa Terracum, though her full-time staff was required to keep it pristine and ready to welcome her without notice. Unfortunately, her time was cut short when a tumor was discovered in 1930, and she passed away just two years later. Without its owner, Villa Terracum sat empty, though her trust employed her staff who kept it maintained as if though she were still alive. A fortune passed from her control to her children in the form of a trust which had been set up by her father, which created one of the most ridiculous situations the probate courts in the U.S. has ever seen. All things considered, she had very little money in her own name. Mostly everything she had was purchased through the trust. When she passed away, the trust was not obligated to pay her debts, as it wasn't her money. At this point, Villa Terracum was placed up for sale in the heart of the Great Depression, when not even the wealthiest Americans were spending that kind of money on vacation homes. And even when offers would be received, the family could not let go of the mansion because its ownership was disputed by creditors who were owed $3 million from her estate. This argument continued in court for two years until it was finally decided the mansion and all of its contents should be auctioned off to pay Edith's debts. While any other estate would have gone into disrepair, her faithful staff had remained gainfully employed maintaining everything from the flower beds to the roof. On the opening day of the auction, as the gates were swung open, a crowd of 3,500 people rushed into the property, parking cars on hedges and trampling over 100-year-old imported rose bushes just to get a glimpse of the legendary villa in Lake Forest. Everything from antiques to art was auctioned off for pennies on the dollar. Everything that is, except for the house. As time went by, Undeveloped chunks of the property were sold off to pay the staff, until just the house and gardens remained. Finally, in 1947, it was purchased by a group of businessmen with the intent to repurpose the house into a club. It went back on the market, sitting abandoned without any staff to maintain it. During the 1950s, it became a popular spot for local teenagers to hang out and trespass. Within a few years, it had been vandalized to the point where it was nearly unrecognizable. Then, in 1956, what remained of the estate was purchased by a developer and torn down to make way for a neighborhood. While the house may be gone, there are still remnants of its once vast gardens gracing the shores of Lake Michigan. What did you think about Villa Terracum? Did you have a favorite room or feature? Let me know down below in the comments section, and while you're there, make sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House.